Oh, wait, one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Dan Friedel reports on a meeting of rainforest nations in Brazil. Gregory Stockel has a story on violence at American hospitals and medical centers. Brian Lynn reports on a game maker that has banned designers from using AI tools to create artwork for its games. Later, we head to Pennsylvania to learn about the Gettysburg National Military Park. But first... Representatives of nations with rainforests in Asia and Africa joined leaders from eight Amazon-area countries for a meeting in Brazil on Wednesday. The nations will produce a statement called United for Our Forests to be presented at COP28 in November. COP28 is the United Nations Climate Change Conference, and it will be held in the Middle Eastern city of Dubai. The eight South American countries, known as the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization, ACTO, opened the meeting on Tuesday. The ACTO includes Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, and Venezuela. The nations agreed to work on developing their economies without harming the rainforest to a point of no return. Representatives also came from the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia, and the French territory of Guyana. The president of Norway, a contributor to the Amazon Fund for Sustainable Development, also joined. Scientists say when 20 to 25 percent of the Amazon rainforest is destroyed, it will reduce rainfall and change the environment. The land will get drier and many kinds of plants and animals will die out. Some environmental activists, however, criticized Tuesday's event, saying the countries did not create a plan with clear goals and deadlines. Brazil's president is Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. In his third term as leader, he is working to save the Amazon, a study last month showed his efforts caused a 42% drop in deforestation in only seven months. The Amazon stretches across an area twice the size of India. Two-thirds of it lies in Brazil, with seven other countries and French Guiana sharing the remaining third. Until recently, critics say South American governments saw the rainforest as a resource for materials they could use to grow their economies. Trees were cleared for cattle, companies drilled for oil and mined the land for minerals and metals, and cities and roads were built through the forest. Indigenous people lost their land and plants and animals became endangered. All the Amazon nations signed the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement to reduce pollution, but experts say the countries have had problems working together. They say the latest agreement should require all nations to end deforestation by 2030. So far, only Brazil and Colombia agreed on that deadline. The nations are also divided on oil drilling in the Amazon. Colombian leader Gustavo Petro called for an end to oil exploration but other nations are not sure they want to follow. The ACTO meeting, however, did receive support from one indigenous leader, Fani Kuiru of Colombia. Kuiru praised the group for recognizing the rights of native people to traditional lands 
and opening a way for indigenous people to participate. In a discussion on Tuesday, De Silva said the Amazon is a passport to a new relationship with the world, where its resources can be valued and put in the service of everyone. I'm Dan Friedel. of violence is increasingly affecting American hospitals and medical centers. Recent attacks at such places make healthcare one of the nation's most violent industries. Data shows American healthcare workers experience more non-deadly injuries from workplace violence than workers in any other profession, including law enforcement. Michael D'Angelo is a former police officer. He now works as a security advisor in Florida. His work centers on health care and workplace violence. He said, Healthcare workers don't even think about risks to their safety when they decide to become a nurse or doctor. But he added, healthcare is four or five times more dangerous than any other profession. Several mass shootings have taken place in hospitals across the country. In June of last year, a gunman killed his doctor and three other people at a medical office in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The gunman said he blamed the doctor for his continuing pain after an operation. In October of last year, a man killed two workers at a hospital in Dallas, Texas, while he was there for his child's birth. This past May, a man opened fire in a medical center waiting room in Atlanta, Georgia. One woman died and four other people were wounded. And late last month, a gunman shot and killed a security guard at Legacy Good Samaritan Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Police later shot and killed the suspect, who was at the hospital for his child's birth. Hospitals and medical centers are trying to create a safer environment for workers. Legacy Health said it plans to add more metal detectors at all of its medical centers. It also plans to require bag searches at every hospital and send patients and visitors to controlled entrances. Legacy Health also said it will provide more officers with stun guns and will add protective measures from bullets to some glass at main entrances. The American Nurses Association says around 40 states have passed laws creating or increasing punishment for violence against health care workers. And some states, including Indiana, Ohio, and Georgia, let hospitals create their own police forces. Critics say private hospital police can worsen the health care and policing inequalities already experienced by black people. They also say private police forces often do not have to release information, 
such as how often they use force or if they detain members of a minority group more often. Deborah Berger is a registered nurse and president of National Nurses United. She said security teams cannot change the reasons leading to violence. Many of the reasons exist because of the country's problematic health care system, she said. Patients and families are often frustrated by high medical bills, limited treatment choices, and long wait times. Hospitals don't really have a complaints department, so the only real target they have is the nurse or staff that are standing right in front of them, she said. Worker shortages mean nurses are forced to care for more patients. That means less time to examine each one for behavior problems. Berger said efforts to calm an aggressive patient are not as effective if nurses have not been able to spend enough time to build a relationship with patients. Some hospitals tell their staff to try to make peace with aggressive visitors and patients. Hospital leaders want to avoid getting bad reviews from patients, Berger said. That is because the Affordable Care Act has tied part of federal repayment rates to patient satisfaction survey results. Low satisfaction means less money for the hospitals. D'Angelo, the former police officer, said, The results of those surveys should never take priority over staff safety. I'm Gregory Stockel. A major American game maker has banned designers from using artificial intelligence, AI tools, to create artwork for its games. The company, Wizards of the Coast, owns the product collection for the popular game Dungeons and Dragons, or D&D. The role-playing game, set in an imaginary world, was first launched in 1974. Toy manufacturer Hasbro is the parent company of Wizards of the Coast and the related company D&D Beyond. Officials at D&D Beyond said they did not find out until recently that one of its artists used AI to create artwork for an upcoming book. The company said in a statement it had talked to the artist involved. D&D Beyond said the artist, who had worked for the company for more than ten years, had agreed to no longer use AI tools for artistic designs. The company said it is also examining its current AI rules. Some D&D fans discovered the AI-developed art in the series. Hasbro bought D&D Beyond for $146.3 million last year. The Rhode Island-based toy company has owned Wizards of the Coast for more than 20 years. The AI artwork in question was part of a soon-to-be-released book of creature descriptions and lore called Bigby Presents, Glory of the Giants. The digital and physical versions of the game are set for release August 15th. 
the use of AI tools to assist with creative work has raised copyright and labor concerns across a number of industries. The issue is part of what is fueling the current Hollywood strike. It also led the music industry organization, the Recording Academy, to change the rules of its Grammy Awards process. Some artists have brought legal action against AI companies for using their work without permission. The Associated Press reported that Hasbro competitor Mattel had used AI-created images to help come up with ideas for a new Hot Wheels toy car. The news agency noted, however, that Mattel has not said exactly how it is using AI in product development. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to discuss this week's technology report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Glad to be here. So we just heard that the publisher of the role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons recently banned the use of AI tools in the creation of game-related artwork. I think there are some good vocabulary words in the report that might be interesting to English learners. So why don't we talk about some of those? Okay, sure. Um, First, let's look at the term role-play. People who play video games have probably already heard the word because it's used a lot in gaming, Um, So in this case, role means the player is taking on the role or position of another person or character. The word role is also used in the entertainment industry. When actors play a role, it means they are playing or portraying a different character in a movie, TV show, or a play. Okay, and how about the word copyright? That one does seem to come up a lot in stories about AI, correct? Yes, that's true. So, a basic definition of this word is the legal right to control the use of an original piece of work, such as a book, movie, play, or song. And a copyright is a legal agreement the creator of the work seeks to protect the use of his or her work by any other individuals and in any other forms. And finally, let's look at the word lore. Sure, this is kind of a fun one, actually. So, lore means a collection of traditional knowledge or stories about a particular subject. And usually this kind of lore is passed down in certain communities by word of mouth over a long period of time. Now, these kinds of traditions and knowledge are common in native communities, for example, And they're very big in a lot of fantasy and video games as well. Great. Thanks again for joining me, Brian. Today, we visit a national park that marks one of the most important events in American history. We are exploring the Gettysburg National Military Park in the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Much of the area around Gettysburg still looks like it did in the 1860s during the Civil War. The town is in the middle of farm country All around are fields of wheat, corn, and other crops. Cows chew on grass under a warm morning sun. Roads that pass through Gettysburg lead to Baltimore, Washington, and other big cities. But years ago, they served another purpose. The roads brought two opposing armies to Gettysburg. One was the United States Army of the Potomac, commanded by General George Gordon Meade. 
The other was the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, led by General Robert E. Lee. His troops had moved north into Pennsylvania from Virginia. There, they had won a series of battles. Now, they were on the move to defeat Meade's army. Lee believed that a southern victory on northern land would force a negotiated settlement of the war. This would mean independence for the Confederate states that were attempting to leave the Union. The Battle of Gettysburg began on July 1, 1863. More than 170,000 soldiers fought for three days. It was the largest battle ever fought in North America. When it ended on July 3rd, more than 50,000 soldiers were dead, wounded, or missing. Many more would die later from their wounds. In the end, General Lee's army lost the battle. The Civil War, though, continued for two more years. But Confederate hopes for independence were never again as high as they had been at Gettysburg. Soon after the Great Battle, people began to visit Gettysburg to try to understand what happened there. One of those visitors, on November 19, 1863, was President Abraham Lincoln. He was invited to help dedicate a ceremony for Union soldiers killed in the battle. Lincoln spoke for just two minutes. His speech began this way. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. President Lincoln had never been satisfied with the reality of American life at that time. The Declaration of Independence in 1776 had declared all men equal. Yet in the South, and earlier in the North as well, black men and women were held as slaves. In his address at Gettysburg, Lincoln described a new future for a nation that would be reunited. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, Gettysburg National Military Park was established in 1895, 32 years after the deadly battle. Gettysburg is the most visited of the Civil War battlefields. Every year, about 2 million people visit the park from around the country and the world. The battlefield covers more than 2,400 hectares. Visitors can find more than 1,300 outdoor sculptures around the battlefield. These are monuments and memorials placed by soldiers' groups and state militias in areas where their troops fought. Volunteer guides explain to visitors what happened in each area 
of the huge battlefield. Visitors can also tour the battlefields on their own, by foot, by car, or by bicycle. Many visitors start their visit to Gettysburg at the Gettysburg Museum of the Civil War. The museum has the world's largest collection of Civil War objects. The museum has more than one million items, from soldiers' private notebooks and uniforms to original maps of the battlefield. The museum also houses the Gettysburg Cyclorama painting. This kind of artwork surrounds the people looking at it. The painting shows the final attack in the Battle of Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge. George Pickett was a Confederate general. On July third, eighteen sixty-three, he led a charge against stronger Union forces. It was a disaster for the Confederate soldiers. French artist Paul Philippotto and a team of twenty artists. Created the painting in the 1880s. Filippetto and his team visited the battlefield. It took more than one year for the huge painting to be completed. The cyclorama is 114 meters long and almost 13 meters tall. It has long been one of the most popular parts of the Gettysburg experience. But by the 1990s, the painting was in poor condition. Experts warned that if the cyclorama was not repaired, the painting could be lost. A restoration project began in 2003. The painting was cleaned and separated into its 14 parts, and later moved into the new center. There. The original canvas was sewn onto new cloth made in China. Park Service officials say China was one of the few countries able to produce cloth in the sizes needed. Then each part was hung and sewn together. A team of cyclorama experts from Poland worked on the project in Gettysburg. The repair work of the Gettysburg cyclorama. Marked one of the largest art conservation efforts ever in North America. After the museum, tourists can visit the Soldiers' National Cemetery, where many of the Union soldiers who died during the Battle of Gettysburg are buried. The cemetery was dedicated on November nineteenth, eighteen sixty-three, the same day. President Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address. Since 1865, the cemetery has been a burial ground for soldiers from all of America's wars. Gettysburg brings history to life during the summer and fall with its living historians. These actors and experts show visitors what life was like for a soldier here. In one of the most historically important places in America, the words of America's 16th president from the Gettysburg battlefield have never been forgotten. Historians agree that Lincoln's Gettysburg address defined Americans as a people who believed in freedom, democracy, and equality. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. 